All right. So I want to read a couple of paragraphs from uh, the inter introduction to John of the Cross's Dark Night of the Soul. And this is a translation done by Mirabai Starr, who's a wonderful teacher. And so this is from her introduction. And the, the couple of paragraphs that I want to read from to deliver us into our own bit of silence are on humility and, um, and silence itself. And it strikes me on Palm Sunday, on this day where we sort of notice that in John's gospel, Jesus gets his own donkey. Um, humility seems seems appropriate. I mean, it seems a really humble thing for Jesus to get his own donkey. Um, if you're familiar with John of the Cross, our 16th century Spanish Christian mystic, and his dark night of the soul, then you know that what the dark night of the soul is, is this marvelous poem and commentary that he wrote. And it describes... I'll, I'll, this would be my simple paraphrase. It describes what it feels like and what happens when all of our usual spiritual rhythms stop working. So I could say the Our Father for 40 years, and then for whatever reason, I enter this season of life where it just doesn't do the trick anymore. The creed doesn't do the trick. Dare I say it, the Eucharist may not do the trick. And that it's a the dark night of the soul is this... this um, this season of life that not everybody enters into, but some people do, um, and you come in and out of it, where all the usual consolations of my spiritual rhythm stop working. And what John said is, these things, now hold this lightly, hold this lightly, these things are taken by God fr from us that we might drop through the bottom of our own lives into a deeper resonance of relationship with God, you know? So the reason the dark night of the soul is a helpful teaching, as John gives it to us, is that sometimes we show up, you know, in each other's lives saying, hey, I might call Ann and say, hey, Ann, my prayer life is a shambles. I don't, I mean, everything I've done is now stopped working. And she might say, you know what? Hold on. You might be in this little fog of darkness as led, I don't know, by the Spirit. Just hold on. Just sort of, just sit in the unknowing, you know, sit in the, it's okay if the creed doesn't work for you for two months. Just don't sweat it. Just see what happens if you, if you just stay in the darkness, you know. And then the teaching is, um, we come through the other side and, and our relationship is deepened. Yeah. Yeah. So you'll hear you'll hear sort of a little bit of resonance of, of that in, in these two readings. So I'm going to read them, these two paragraphs. I'm going to ring the bell. I'll hold this in two minutes of silence. Then I'll say the Our Father slowly by myself, which will allow you all to sort of, at a pace, emerge from the silence. Then we'll look at the text. Humility, then, is not a matter... Humility, then, is not a matter of beating ourselves up. It is not a question of judging ourselves as stupid or sinful, as hopeless and bad. Who are we to judge these things? Humility, for John of the Cross, is the gentle acceptance of that most tender place inside ourselves that throbs with the pain of separation from the Beloved. It is that deep knowingness that identification with the false self brings nothing but further separation. It is an initially reluctant dropping down into the emptiness and an ultimate experience of peace when we stop doing and rediscover simple being. Humility is the Sabbath of the soul when we heed the call to cease creating and remember that we are created. If all your spiritual activities have grown empty and you are compelled to walk away, says John of the Cross, 
Tie yourself to one practice only, contemplative silence. Abandon discursive prayer if it has become mechanical and meaningless. Let go of holy images if they no longer evoke the sacred. Refrain from spiritual discourse if it tastes like idle gossip in your mouth. But do not, oh please do not, turn away from the silence. Now the silence after the scripture which says, Be still, then know that I am God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, <clears throat> so let's read the sermon up to today's reading. Um, Kristen, have you got the text there? Yes. Will you, re will you start us off? Will you read Matthew chapter 5? 
1 through <clears throat> 16. Okay. Anne, would you read for us today? Yeah. Will you pick up at chapter Matthew chapter 5, 17 and take us through 37? And then let's do, we'll, we'll make it simple. Let's do three readers. Virginia, will you take us through 5 and 38? Through 6 and 15. I actually have a little mistake on the, on the schedule. It should be fit through 15. So if you'll take us through 6 and 15. That's through today, right? Yeah. Does that sound good? So three readers. And so what? remember what we're doing is we're on a bear hunt for our own values. And we think the Sermon on the Mount is ground zero for where Jesus gives us those values. And so what we try to do is read the, the entire sermon up to the point that we're, we've reached in our study. So this will get us everything that we've studied so far, inclusive of that which is appointed for today, which is Matthew 6, 9 through 15. So Kristen, whenever you're ready, you can start us off. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who persecuted, who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost, lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket but on the lampstand, and gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works, and give glory to your Father in heaven. I think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, nor the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. 
But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your inner enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not keep up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. All right. Beautiful. Thank you. So... <clears throat> What in that from any of the, any of it at all, reaches out to you, grabs you, whether it causes, raises a question, gives you pause, gives you hope, concern, confusion, peace. Um, is there anything in there that you hadn't heard before? Do you, do you look at the text and think, well, that wasn't there? We can pay special attention to 
6, 9 through 14 today, and the Our Father piece there. But certainly the whole sermon to, to this point is fair game. So the floor is open. One thing I'll offer on 6, 8, I've always been intrigued by that verse because your father knows what you need before you ask him. Often, I used to have this funny argument with a good friend about whether we should pray for 1995 for a new pair of shoes, okay? And somehow, I've always loved that purity prayer that we start off with, that, mm. you know, he knows what we need. And I often have learned that sometimes if I ask for something, he may have something better in mind. So I go back and forth when I get prayer requests from people about to pray very specifically for something. And I always, I mean, maybe I even feel a little guilty. I think, well, I'll pray for God to send what is needed. But that's a little of me realizing I can't be in control. So that's that's one thing that's always interested me in that that verse. Hmm. That may, this is so, that just makes me think of this funny thing that when Hendry and I were young growing up and we would write letters to Santa Claus about what we wanted, we of course had a list, but we would always end it with, and anything else Santa Claus thinks we might want. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't want, in case there was something we hadn't thought of, to your point, we did not want Santa Claus be, to be limited by this right. list. Right? <laughs> we, don't, we don't want God to be limited by our list. <laughs> I love it. And so I'll say that um, the Gospel of Matthew generally, um, but especially this um, this section with the Sermon on the Mount, and, and is is very mm. visual to me. Um, mm. I, I was just doing the math in my head. It's been forty five years ago, fully, um, that I did um, the the Broadway musical Godspell in high school. And at the time then, it was newish. So this is like, you know, mid-1970s. And it's based on the gospel, according to Matthew. And I can still, when I hear this read, I can still hear and just and visualize who was saying, and don't be like the hypocrites who pray in front of everyone with their broad phylacteries. And I remember thinking, what is a phylactery? You know what I mean? You know, and so it's one of those things that I, it just feels so rooted in me. So I think that's part of my joy in being part of this um, discussion, this teaching around Sermon on the Mount. But I think just broadly of all the gospels, probably Matthew is the one that is most embedded in my soul because of of the words and the dance and the, the music and the singing and the, everything about it that comes out of that, that stage play. And, and what's remarkable about it, and I think speaks to me as well, is that it brought together, it's been a little weepy, um, hmm. it brought together this bunch of high school kids that would never have spent time together. We would never have spent three months intensely together because there was a jock. There was a guy that went on professionally to be a mime. Um, there were several kids that would have considered themselves to be you know, theater kid, you know, pibs, people in black, the theater kids. Um, there were some really smart kids that like didn't normally do theater. They were just the smart kids. This mix of us that came together and had this intensely spiritual experience together and had to rely on each other um, because it's such an interactive show. You don't have a character. You interweave in and out of all these different sort of character statements and positions. I mean, there certainly is a, a, it's a Judas and a, and a Christ, but beyond that. And so, so I think today just hearing this again really took me back. Oh, Mary, thank you. Beautiful. I really um, discovered something new when it says that uh, in Matthew's um, "Forgive us our trespasses, well, our debts." He said that it that uh, rather the book um, Sermon on the Mount um, said that the debts were also considered uh, trespasses that they're interchangeable. That you know when you're reading the the Our Father's prayer, you, that "Forgive us our trespasses" also means debts. 
that um, they're interchangeable, that, that it also means sin. And I never thought of it that way. I, I was very surprised. And now I have a new enlightenment that I can, I can pray because I always say that prayer at the beginning before I pray every day. Yeah. I know I pray throughout the day, but now I have a new understanding of it. And, and is that your understanding of it as well, Henry? Yes. Say that last part again that, that, you, that, that you it, find particularly that meaningful. That trespasses mean the same thing as sin. Yeah. yeah. Which I never understood that as being that. I mean, that was the new enlightenment for yeah. me. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of this reading, which I don't know if it's, I mean, there was a lot of other things in, in this chapter, but I read, I, I have a new understanding. And um, I first I started to resent some of the things she said. I thought she was taking Christ, like she said, there was something about a joker or something. And I thought, that's strange. I don't appreciate that. And then I kept reading about no, I've got to finish this. I'm going to read it. The whole chapter nine began to see things in here that um, uh, you know, on page 81, I, I read something that said that it was like um, that she thought that Christ was on the chubby side. I thought, that's not polite, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I thought, no, I, I've never seen a movie where I saw Christ as chubby. <laughs> and I had pictures of Christ all over it. I don't see that being the case as well and and uh and um and so you know i have to tell you i i have uh i have actually died and christ brought me back to life and um and i remember him laying me back in my body and um i was in intensive care for a number of days as well as in the hospital and um I really did die, and uh, and I, ever since then I've praised the Lord. I've, I've been with Him. I I've, I I love the Lord. I, I I glorify Him very much, and um, it was a wonderful experience. But it's not like where you where I, I've heard other people speak that you go to heaven and you uh, see all these lights and everything else. I didn't experience that at all. And, uh, but ever since then, I've been, I've been very thankful and each day is a new day and, a, and I have a, a heart condition, but I, I don't take any medication. I, I give it all to Christ. I let him guide me. And, um, but each day is a brand new day and I, I love, I, I'm very thankful, but, but this was a good chapter after all. I'm glad I read it. I'm very glad I read it, and um, so I have to I have to keep an open mind on everything, and I do pray for the, my enemies very much, though, because everyone has an opinion. Even I have to keep from being judgmental. But anyway, I'll stop talking now. Thank you. Beautifully thank put. Thank you for listening. <laughs> oh gosh, thank you for sharing. Beautifully, beautifully put, Helene. And what I hear everyone pointing to so far, it's what I hear is um, being sort of the, the, this sort of sense of being touched by the, by the scripture, touched by God in some tender way, right? Whether it's Anne and Virginia's awareness that there is a depth dimension to our prayer life that, that God has access to or intends for us that is way below the surface. And we come in through the surface and pray for all manner of surface level things, but there's this intuition in us that there's something far deeper here. And then Mary's beautiful, gosh, Mary, remembrance of, you know, 45 years ago being un, like out of, it seems like out of nowhere, unwittingly, unsuspectingly being moved over a period of 90 some odd days to be communing with some other teenagers around the text. And that my sense is, Mary, your story touched me. I mean, it, and it, my sense is what I'm hearing in your witness is that it touched you all in a way that is resonant in a really nourishing way, even 45 years later. And then Helene, your witness to your very um, sort of tactile, visceral relationship with our Lord 
even in the, the valley of the shadow of death. My sense is, I wonder, Anne, if this comes back to your verse 8. Your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And I'm, I'm wondering if, if <laughs> what God knows is that we need, we need to be moved by love in the, in the deepest way. Um, and <laughs> sort of, I don't mean this disrespectfully, but everything else is secondary, whether it's a Santa Claus list or, to be honest, praying that I get over my sickness. I mean, everything else, which, both of which are fine things to pray for. We're not judging anybody's prayer. Everything else is such a distant second to the sort of felt knowledge that, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death or whatever may befall me, I fear no evil, not because evil doesn't exist or suffering doesn't exist, but because you, O oh God, go with me. And I wonder if that's the thing that God knows that we need. Because I don't know about you, but everything else I've there, we can pick this apart, and, and there's subtlety in it, so don't don't go too far with it. But just about everything else I've prayed for, or or sort of gone for and gotten, it comes up short, doesn't it? Yeah. Short that is when sort of laid up against a felt experience of God's love, whether coming unmediated as as Helene gives witness to, or through the life of of another. Beautiful. What, what else is in all of this? Yeah, go ahead. I think one thing that everyone's talking about, whether it's this way or not, is the deepening of our faith. Yep. <clears throat> um, to, to get back to the values, which is, I think, the point of this study, I was um, uh, gracious enough to, uh, to participate in a value study years ago and actually went to my attic to find them to see what I wrote down. Oh, cool. And the one thing the thing I remember is it helped me so much in my life, whether I was a mother, a worker at church, scrubbing dishes, doing the laundry, because I was consistent if I had these values. And the only thing that really had changed is I now would put verbs in them. Chris, I thought you'd like that verbs, you know? So like, instead of just God or faith, it has a verb in it now. So, and I think that just comes from, probably hopefully from maturity and just aging and experiences. And, but it does have to do with what you said, Hendry. It's about, there is an ultimate prayer that's to God mm. and it's not about, it's worship. It's, it's glorifying. It's not about what someone individually needs. It's, it's just being still with him. Can we also say, Anne, can we kind of like talk out of the other side of our mouth and also say, your, your, your sharing earlier really made me, caused me to think of, there's something incredibly valuable about me praying for somebody else, like their prayer request, because it decenters me. And anytime I can get decentered and, and devote myself to, to someone else, that seems to deepen my relationship with God and my neighbor. And like Virginia said, who am I? I mean, so I love to, I love to hold the tension of, of the two, you know? It's also, it's, it's bringing up for me the thought too that There's no circumstance, there's no environment, there's no nothing that is absent of God, right? Mm, like, yeah. you know, like when a child, you know, when you say, okay, we're going to do this every day. You mean we're going to do it on Sundays? Yes, we're going to do it every day. What about Tuesdays? Yes, we're going to do it every day, right? Like it's over and over again. It's like, yes, God, every single time. Well, what about when it's really terrible? Is God there too, right? Yes, every single moment, breath, fiber, molecule, right? Has God in it, right? Like no matter, like come up, okay, tell me what scenario you got. God's yeah. there. Yeah. Which is hard to, we, we don't, we want to believe it and we don't want to believe it, right? Like we, we keep testing that to see if that's really 
really true. Yeah. Yeah, nice. I'm thinking about the story I dealt with yesterday. I was at Walmart. Mm. And it was just about done. I used, I think you know, but it's a little go cart as I call. And this woman came up to me. And she's like, these are for him. I'm get on the bus and she's like, you can't take that. You, that's Walmart. And FYI, this is for handicapped people. And I wanted to put the car in backwards and run over. <laughs> I just let it go. I didn't say anything. And I felt, I said, Hendra Harris. Saying, let it go. Love is all. Just let her love. <laughs> but it could have been God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great, Misty. So you didn't run over her? Yeah, I wanted to. <laughs> but you didn't do it. <laughs> that is so awesome. <laughs> Well, because that's the deal, though, right? Like, we're not promised that you aren't going to feel like you want to, but the step is you didn't do it, right? Like, <laughs> it doesn't mean that all of, that all of a sudden, you know, everything is goodness and light and you never feel <laughs> negative towards anybody else in your life, but it's then, what do you do? How do we practice and gear ourselves towards how do we respond? <laughs> Open my eyes. Yeah. You know, Misty, that's a good segue into a question that I I wrote down on my notes coming into this time we have together. And so the, my my question is this: If we if we're all, we're looking for our own values, right? And we know that the core value is we have a sense that the core value is this molten love out of which we're all created. God is love. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So love is this, this just absolute core Christian value. And then through the life and teachings of Jesus and through the Sermon on the Mount in particular, the operational values surface, right, from that core love value. So love takes different shapes, operational values. I just call them that. So a question is, how can these operational values that we get from Jesus and that we've gotten a download of so far in the Sermon on the Mount help us know what to do and not do when we disagree with our neighbor? And I want to introduce a, a, just a little, a little further complication before, you, you all, before we share. And... This comes to my mind because of my own engagement with the John gospel appointed for today. And like I tried to say in the sermon, um, you know, what was pointed out to me was something that's been in front of me for my whole life, but I just never noticed. In John's gospel, in the 12th chapter, in the sort of Palm Sunday scene, as it were, Jesus gets his own donkey. And that is utterly unique to John. If you go back and look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's a totally different scene. Totally different. It, in the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those other three, it's that standard deal where he sends two guys ahead of him and they get the donkey and talk to the donkey's owner. Even Mark, who's Mr. Short Story and who leaves out most of the details, has that detail in it. Does that make sense? So, one of the things we can make of that now, some of you are going to going to turn off your Zoom when I say this, is that everyone is right. Now, you hold that lightly. Please hold that lightly, because you just started a laundry list of people in your mind who are not right, and, <laughs> and I'm, I'm probably one of them <laughs> for what I just said. But there's this idea that, that everyone is right. Now, why? It's not that there's no truth. It's that each of us is speaking acting, storytelling, whatever, living from our own perspective. Okay? This is not relativizing truth. 
This is not relativizing anything. It's simply in a very measured, very controlled way saying Virginia is acting from Virginia's perspective and nobody else is. Oh, but I'm just like Virginia. I don't care. You're not acting and telling the story from Virginia's perspective. You're just not, right? Okay, so <laughs> everyone is right, which doesn't mean everyone is right. You know, if you wanted to take a vote, probably John is wrong. Because three of the other three all told it in the exact same way, and then John's got Jesus found his own donkey. And we know that John was the latest gospeler. So there's a reasonably good chance that John glossed that because he just didn't know. I, Jesus got a donkey. How did he get it? I don't know. It's not important to my story. Just put in there, Jesus found a donkey. <laughs> I'm, I'm being a little bit playful, but you, you, you kind of get the point. So, so um, one teacher, his name is Claire Graves, who discovered a thing called spiral dynamics that we could talk about sometime. Um, and we teach spiral dynamics, actually, in Episcopal Exploration. If you want to come learn about it, that, that'll happen in a few weeks. Claire Graves discovered spiral dynamics, which is a map of the evolution of human consciousness. And what spiral dynamics does that's so loving and helpful is it, it locates people in their own stage of consciousness, Right? And unfolds like it just unfolds a map of life unfolding in different stages of consciousness. You gave good witness to it, Anne, when you said, "You know, if I had to do these again today, I'd I'd write verbs." Okay, when well, you even said it, because I've I've grown or I've aged or something like that, you know. So one of the things Claire Graves said is at the end of his life, and he discovered the spiral in uh, I think the forties. Anyway, he said, "Darn it, everybody has a right to be where they are." Does that make sense? So in the evolution of human consciousness, whatever stage you're in, you have a right to be there. Now, the way we act in the public arena is probably not usually that gracious. You actually don't have a right to be where you are. You need to come be where I am. <laughs> you know, but, but what if everyone is right and everyone has a right to be where they are? And that is not, and I'm repeating myself, that's not relativizing. That's not what we call flat line, where there's flat land, where there's no truth, you know. The fact is, that the, the more we mature, we understand that some people are more right than others, you know. You know. Um, we've discovered for ourselves as contemporary Westerners that polyamory is not right for us, you know. For the vast, you know, monogamy in the Christian tradition, you know, that's, that's right. So here's my question. I will restate it. If we don't want to just go to war, the culture wars, and I'm right and Pam's wrong, and I'll, you know, one day I'll arm wrestle her into seeing it my way. If we don't want to go down that road, and I don't, I'm so tired of it, how can these values that we're getting download from in the Sermon on the Mount help us know what to do and not do when we disagree with our neighbor? And see if, as we sort of wrestle with, if we sort of begin to speak into that question, go, go deep. Like, don't try to solve the problem of Pam and I disagree on an issue, right? Don't, don't, don't start there. Start deeper than that, if that makes any sense. So, does anything come to mind, come to your heart, from the, from the teachings that we've gotten so far? However simple. There's no right or wrong answer either. It seems to me, one of the reasons I, I love the whole Sermon on the Mount yep. and feeding mm -hmm. everybody was that um, it doesn't didn't really matter what happened to him, what he was accused of. He continued to try to understand those that were accusing him Amen. and forgive them and move on. And yep. he did not try to argue with them at all. He just accepted, moved on, continued to love them, continued to give, and um, and I guess that's to, to me it's an example of what we really need to do is to try to do that. And then further on what you were saying about eyewitness account on writing the scripture, you always hear that argument from people who don't believe in the Bible about how you know it's not accurate. <laughs> and uh, to me, that's very funny because even in the courtroom, we all know that eyewitness account is not a hundred percent. And right. you can have five, six eyewitnesses who will tell a different story of the same account. I mean, just look at the tragedies we've had recently with the, the different killings and the you know, mass uh, attacks. Those people have all got their own accounts yep. 
-hmm. and their account's not wrong. It's how it felt to them. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that on that note, even though it may be very hard to understand the perspective of some of our people uh, in social, you know, situations, we have to realize that that's how they're seeing it and try to accept that. And likewise, they need to learn to accept us and then somewhere try to find a middle ground. Beautifully put, Carol. So what I hear you saying as far as the value that emerges from the, the model of Jesus is that he wasn't caught arguing with people very often. He just... No. It was just uh -huh. a... I used to say a kind of a love anyway. Just a love... Love, love. And, you know, I wonder, you know, one of the reasons I, I don't like to argue too much, though I'm very human, so I can certainly get caught up, is that I understand mm -hmm. life is short. And, you know, if John Doe and I argue about this today and ruin our friendship over it, then, well, one of us is gone, moves away, dies, whatever. And our legacy is that we got really hot and bothered about X, Y, or Z. And if anybody's and life was short, because, you know, once you get to a certain age, you really don't want to waste your breath on arguing. <laughs> well, and that's what so, I was, that's where I was kind of pretty. Yeah. And, and if anyone's life was short, it was Jesus's, right? Yes. It's three, three years of active ministry. Yeah. Yeah. Who else, who else noticed something in there that informs how these values can help us know what to do and not do when we disagree with our neighbor or a family member? Yeah. When we look at the, the difference with um, with John's report being different, yeah. you know, when I look at it, I think, on one hand, I don't, I don't really care because the point is not so much how he got the donkey, but that he got the donkey and he went into Jerusalem and he followed the path that he was on. And so I tend to to look at, I guess, ask myself the question of like what matters. And, and I think in my own life and, operation, and operationalizing um, values, from the internal to the external world, you know, I have to think in terms of impact, not just intention. Yeah. And, um, and in the way that I interact with people in the world, um, because I'm doing a lot of work around anti-racism, including my own internal work about being anti-racist, um, that a lot of times there can be really okay intentions and some really awful impacts outcomes and i probably said that before in in this space i know i've said it in other spaces and i think my choice about how i interact with others is whether harm's being done or not and if somebody is is doing behaviors that are harmful to others then i'm more likely to step in and to say let's look at what's let's look at the impact of what's happening here because to fail to do that is to collude so silence is complicity and so there are times where i am more likely to step in and and confront a behavior not out of not caring about that person but about seeing harm that's being done and also within myself trying to acknowledge that there is some purpose in their behavior there's some they clearly they've learned it somewhere along the way if they're behaving in openly racist ways but probably underneath all that there's probably fear of loss of status fear of loss of way of life fear of loss of something it doesn't make the behavior okay but it helps soften me a little bit to not go at them um, with, you know, with my fists clenched, I guess. Hmm. Nicely put, Mary. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with Mary. I, I agree very strongly with Mary. Um, but, um, you know, I always go to the Lord on everything first. Um, he's my number one. And um, I also turn to the Bible, the Old Testament, as well as the New. And um, in Samuel 15, Number 22 and 23, um, you always need to obey his voice, God. And that's, you have to be obedient to him. And um, I also think that um, God told me a long time ago, I hear his voice all the time, because of my experience, I think. But um, he told me a long time ago, like when I went to register for voting, he told me a long time ago to be independent. And I thought independence is be neutral on everything. Be neutral first. And um, so he told me to register as independent. And so I did. And uh, I found that to be a valuable experience because you're not to argue with anyone. And that's the same thing as the, you know, the lesson in John about getting the donkey. It's the same thing as what Mary's talking about. Don't argue with anyone. Be, be kind. Be, 
do the fruits of the spirit. Think about that. And I, I found that to be a valuable experience anyway. God bless you all. <laughs> Thank you, Helene. Thank you. Makes me think of, um, you know, if we if we think about our, our own values and think about where we are, and, you know, we all experience joy, we all experience pain, we all experience fear or those kinds of things. And if you can go to those and the other person instead of the thing that the argument or the fight is about, right? And remember that we are all connected and in the same way that I feel pain, they feel pain. And we might, that doesn't mean we feel pain about the same things or in the same way, but we both feel pain. And if we can, if I can remember that and think, okay, all right, this is painful to you. Let me, let me acknowledge and value that you are in pain and be compassionate about that. Yeah regardless of whether I think what you're saying or you're doing right. Like that, that's not for, that's not necessarily for me, but I can at least connect with, with that, the core of that, the emotion behind it. Yeah. Which then helps me act, maybe helps me act in a different way. Sure. About it. Our common pain. Yeah. Powerful. What these values do for me is there is so much need everywhere that I've had to, like Helen, Helen, you said, I go to God when I get a stimulus about anything. I, mm. I have to first stop, look at the image of God and realize they're different from me, Virginia. But where this is taking me is I can't fix all this that's wrong. Hmm. There's a lot that's wrong out there. But what I can do is go do something that will make a difference. I'm not one for talking about how to get something done. I would rather do it. Um, I mean, an example I'll use is that until COVID for years, and I will go back, is still I work with the uh, the children, the babies born addicted at UK. And this has been going on since 2001. It's a horrible situation. But one thing it's done for me is I, my judgment's gone to discernment. I have hmm. to understand that if there are parents there, I don't completely understand it. They do love these children but I'm there to love. That's what those babies need. And it takes me a while to get into it when I'm there. But when I have those moments with those babies, loving them and tell them about God and praying for them, that's the purest I'll ever get. Yeah. That's the purest I'll ever get because it's awful. It needs to stop, but that's, I have to, I don't want to file papers on, you know, like I want to actually be touching the problem. Yeah. Like Mary, like teaching my grandchildren not to be racist instead of reading a book about it. I, I'm more of a doer in my little realm. I can't argue with people. I can only do with what I think, but I want to touch the problem, not do it. But my only guilt in this is that we're not addressing the root problems of the drug addiction. It's such a complicated issue that sometimes I feel like I'm a Band-Aid on the problem, but Band-Aids are needed. So anyway, that's my two cents. Hmm. You're the salt, man. You're being the salt for those babies. That's right. Well, I, and, and that's what they tell us, that you don't realize the difference it makes. I get more out of it than probably the babies do. I mean, selfishly, but... It's not, it is addressing it with God's love, but it's not, this is one thing where I would argue with people, we need to stop this. It, it needs to stop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any abuse of children, I think we all would agree, it needs to stop. But I can't fix it, but God can. 
Beautifully put. That's a great, that's a really nice, that's a really helpful, hopeful illustration of my sense of one of the, one of the core things that we all struggle with, which is th this sense of otherness. This is sort of what I hear Virginia say it too, and the new building on it, Anne, is this sort of, this sense that we are other than beloved, right? And one of the ways that we can draw up sort of lines in the sand and, and, make other people enemies is we have to other them. We have to make them other than fully connected to us as siblings in the great family of God. Um, and my sense is that's one of the things you're transmitting to the baby. We know that this is our science here. I mean, we know this is a fact. One of the things you're transmitting to the babies is, um, is this love that is totally contrary to their alienation. They've been alienated by the disease of addiction and the circumstances of their environment over which they're powerful. So I'm powerless rather. So you're, you're countering that with this transmission of love, which is not, you know, poetry. It is poetic, but it's not poetry. It's science. I mean, you, you, you guys know that it's, yeah, I've done a, a part of my great passion and you may have heard me talk about this is, is working in the world of recovery. And since about the year 2000, I've been involved with working with drug addicts starting down in, in, um, uh, not 2000, 2003, down in Dalton, Georgia. Uh, anyway, um, over the years, I would, I've, I've asked people in the throes of addiction every now and then that I've worked with, like, what, why are you doing what you're doing? And I don't ask it in an accusatory way, but in a curious way. Like, t let's tell me. I'll never forget in the early days, one young man just, he didn't even look at me. He just kept on going. He said, just trying to get happy. Just trying to get happy. And he wasn't, it wasn't flippant. It wasn't fraternity boy. It was just... It was, he was speaking out of that enormous emptiness, that otherness that he felt. Um, and then another young man one time told me it had been there ever since he was as young as he could remember, you know? He doesn't remember the beginning of the emptiness. And I think that emptiness, that alienation, that um comes out of feeling like one doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, we, we talk a lot in, in my world, working with college students who may be pretty isolated and, and alienated for some reasons um, about mattering. And um, they just talk about belongingness. And, and I think going beyond that, it's really about mattering. And so, and what I would say that you provide to those infants and children who have um, addicted parents um, or addicted caregivers is that they matter whether you say anything to them, whether they remember it 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, the sense that someone gave undivided attention and emotional presence and probably some physical contact um, at a time where they otherwise wouldn't have gotten that, that, that does break the cycle. It changes the cycle. It puts those kids at less risk that they're going to repeat um, what their environment otherwise probably would have handed them. And I think, again, in our own ways, whether it's babies or whether it's others in our lives, I think we've all got that capacity to, to do that. Yeah, very good. And, and that's, I don't know if y'all watched some of the stories that came out of the shooting in Colorado, but one, one that hit me the other day was this little boy that went and bought flowers and gave them to the supermarket workers. Oh, huh. Did y'all see that? No, that's and awesome. Though. Said, when they interviewed him, he said that he just wanted them to know that they were appreciated and show some kindness and that what the world really needed was for everyone to start being kind to one another, that we were lacking kindness. And I thought, wow, you know, out of the mouths of babes, if you will. And it was funny because earlier they had interviewed a couple of the survivors and one young man, he was, he was so torn up. And that's exactly what he said is that he just did not understand why people could not just be kind to each other where you know where was this meanness coming from that we really needed to get back to being kind to one another which kind of goes back to your you know to our love is all thing you know yeah so and and the influence of one small person that's like teachers they they had a piece about you know how all of us remember our favorite teacher mm. so you might not think as a teacher that you have that big an impact but you do. And years later, you may be in the memory of these students that you've had as being the one person that, that cared and showed them that they matter. You know, going back to what Mary's saying yeah. about making sure that, they, that you matter and the emptiness that you're talking about with the addicted people. I always think 
that those people that are seeking out, they, they totally are trying to fill a void. And so you, it's sad to think, like you said, that the one young man said he felt that as far back as he could remember. It makes you wonder what his childhood was like, you know? It's pretty I, sad. Oh, sure. And and I think, you know, the the reason I love the illustration about the, the babies is because that's just an archetype for a, it's a, it's a, it's a big, huge archetype with a lot of drama around it. But all of us have that. That's the human, it's, it's the human condition writ large, you know, in that big addiction example. But we, we all have somewhere in us, and this is the, this is the archetypal story of the Garden of Eden, really, in Adam and Eve. We all have within us what, what Thomas, Father Thomas Keating calls a human condition, some sense of otherness that is an illusory sense that we are separate from God. And Keating always says that it's an illusion. It feels real, it, it, and in some regards, it, it almost kind of, it is our reality. But ultimately, in this beautiful, in the most ultimate terms, it is illusory. And so I love this idea that y'all are really spinning out there right now, that the values um, really keep us from othering each other. I love the example of the kid taking the flowers to the store clerk, because then that store clerk is not just somebody who is emotional, who was a victim of trauma in their workplace. They are that, but that could other them, right? right. But they, they are someone that a young child took flowers to that Carol just told the Sunday school class about. I mean, that's huge. They're famous now for that. I'm being silly to make the point, but check this out. Check this out. We, so we could bring up gun control, right? And now we could all spin off about gun control. And I could tell you my views, and then we could all go around the horn. And then I'm sure y'all are probably, I'd be mad at somebody, I'm sure, because I'm human, right? Y'all are more mature than I am. But it's like, oh, I can't believe that, you know. We could bring up any other issue you like, you know. And that would be the issue othering us from each other, right? Aww. And we could, yeah. You know, Great. How's that working out for you, right? <laughs> uh, you know, or we could we could not do that, and we could focus more on on. I, I, I'm kind of adventurous. It's like, no, you know what? I'm not going to let you other me. Playfully, like I'm not going to say that to you, but I'm going to like inside, like to Helene's. It's like, and Anne's like, I'm going to go to Jesus and say, Jesus, silently in my own head, you know, I'm not going to let myself or this person be othered, each of us from the other in this moment. What would you have me do? Um, one of the things that strikes me that kind of like the, the babies at Ann's work that's, works with that's right in front of our faces is that, that the tragedy in Colorado has reminded me of, um, and not to diminish that tragedy because that's horrifying, but there, there are an enormous amount of deaths by gun, uh, suicide, in our country, yes. far outweighs random gun violence, which is not to say that random gun violence isn't an absolute oh, unspeakable thing that, frankly, personally for me, scares, scares, my, scares me witless. But man, think of our brothers and sisters who are so othered by whatever is around them that they take their own lives by suicide, you know? Yep. Yet another reason that I will touch on gun control. Another reason that we definitely need some sort of process that checks your mental status before you can purchase and own a gun. I do think there is, and it, Henry, you, the, the young man in the throes of addiction saying, I'm just trying to get happy, yeah. right? Like in, in all of this talk of a void, I think that there is this great fear that there is a void that and in that void there is literally nothing so there is yeah. no god there is no love yeah. there is no anything and to me what i live on the hope of that that's a false premise right mm. like that there isn't there isn't such a thing what i am holding on to is there is no place where there is no god Amen. that yep. doesn't mean that there aren't horrible terrible things that doesn't mean that this life isn't full, full of both joy and pain, but it means there is no darkness that's truly darkness that can fully consume me. Yeah, yeah, beautifully put. It feel like that. Oh, God, it can feel like that. But yeah. then somebody like Anne is going to hold me and help me remember 
that it's not real, that yeah. it that this too shall pass, that this darkness yeah, is yeah. not mm-hmm. other than God. And so we're going to get through it. Yeah. We're going to get through it. And how you started today, Father Henry, with that reading, it reminded me I've come to like, enjoy Good Friday. Yeah. Because <clears throat> that void is there in yeah. all of us. But Kristen, hope, I mean, Virginia, hopefully you we get to where that void is not negative to us when we're really struggling. It's just being still. Yeah. And Good Friday, it's okay to be sad, to be yeah. empty, to That's be, right. <clears throat> because it does make you think, what if we, what I often think, what if I didn't have God to go to? What, where would I be? Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I kind of do some backwards thinking there, but I've learned to, um, I remember as a little girl, Good Friday service is like, oh my, <laughs> you know, it's just not fun. I mean, that's what you think when, you know, when you're a kid, but now I enjoy the quiet. I, yeah. Even in COVID, when we had the the 20 minute services and 15 minutes of it was quiet. I like that. Yeah. It forces you to just be. Because that's all we've got. Sure. Hmm. Beautifully put. Well, isn't it? It's true that there's like no. I think Good Friday reminds us that of the there's joy that comes out of darkness, right? So, I, I've always liked Good Friday because even though it's sad, and you think about that aspect on the other flip side we have the hope of what's to come yeah so it's a good reminder when we're going through troubled times to remember these things that's right i i I came across this other book that my grandmother actually gave me it's called the lord and his prayer about by nt Wright. it's also about the lord's prayer and it had this sentence in it is keeps calling out to me it says we are called to live and pray at the place where the world is in pain so that the hopes and fears, the joy and the pain of the whole world may become by the spirit and in our own experience, the hope and fear, the joy and pain of God. Mm. Which is, it's all in there together and all of it is ours and God's together. And if we can keep remembering that, then we just aren't ever, ever alone. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Beautiful. So as we, as we wind down, anything else left in there? Anybody want to offer before we? You know, you talk about gun tr- control. I mean, I personally, how many people have known someone or about someone that have committed suicide to drugs? I I can't tell you. I know a lot more people that way than I do know by guns. Um, I, I'm, I know I'm supposed to stay, stay neutral, but uh, this summer I had to go do a ministry in New Orleans because this person took us, took himself by drug suicide that he left his sister and she has no family left. And um, so I <laughs> broke my heart. Just broke my heart that he did that, but yeah. you know, I I know he's with God now. I know that, and um, so, but his sister's all alone now, and she has no family, and um, and of course, it just ripped her up terribly. She's very young, yeah. and um, but she's found God now. It's a terrible, selfish act. That's for sure. It affects all. Yeah, but he was troubled. He was because, very troubled. Maybe so, it's because yeah. of being in the South. I don't know. But I sadly know more people that have taken their life with a gun than with drugs. So, and maybe it's a cultural thing. I don't know. But, and most of these were all men that I'm thinking of. So I don't know if there's a relationship there as to them doing it that way. But um, it's I've seen it too much. Very violent. Very violent. Yep. So as we move into Holy Week, maybe 
I wonder if one of, of our, our attention, sort of propelled by the energy that we get in the Sermon on the Mount, I wonder if our intention for the week can be the sort of subtle, subtle stance by which we ask God to help us be on the lookout where folks would try to other us. And when we discover that, sort of playfully not let them, you know? By, not by sort of taking them on. Well, I learned in Sunday school that you're not to, <laughs> but like, and, and, and don't be afraid to fail at it. I mean, I think mostly, mostly we fail at it, which is great. That's how you learn, you know? Like, but just like subtly, just like slowly, subtly, easily, just like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to wander out to this false land called, you know, enemy territory where you and I are at odds. I'm going to sort of stay tethered to the, to the present moment by the sheer grace of God, because I can't do it on my own, where we, um, we diminish our efforts at othering each other. So I'm going to end on that. And I could talk to you guys all day long. I love you. I love being a part of this with you. And um, so next Sunday is Easter. So we will not meet on Easter Sunday. We'll meet again the following Sunday. And we have two more times together where we finish the prayer and then sort of try to put it all together. So again, we'll not meet next Sunday, but we'll be back here. Same space, same Zoom link, all that kind of stuff. Um, it looks like to me it's April 11th. So God bless you. Peace be All with right. you. Have, Have a great day. Week. Have a good week. Don't let anybody <laughs> other you. And don't, we should also say, and don't other anybody. <laughs> yeah, I was going to offer a friendly amendment because yeah. I'm really more concerned about my tendency to other others. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Thank you. I need to, to be the recipient of right. othering. So. I need to work on my humility too. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Peace. Bye. Peace. Bye. Peace.